It's a joy to be with you again this evening, and uh, we're going to continue our study of the book of Revelation. We're in chapter 3, and tonight we're taking up the Church of Philadelphia. Church of Philadelphia, and we are going to be reading from the Word in Revelation 3, beginning at verse 7. So if you have your Bibles, you could follow me uh, in whatever Bible translation you have. With uh, number seven, we begin with these words. Write to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. Thus says the Holy One, the true one, the one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will close, and who closes and no one opens. I know your works. Look, I have placed before you an open door, that no one can close because you have but little power. Yet you have kept my word, and you have not denied my name. Note this, I will make those from the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews and are not, but are lying. I will make them come and bow down at your feet, and they will know that I have loved you because you have kept my command to endure. I will also keep you from the hour of testing that is going to come on the whole world to test those who live on the earth. I am coming soon, so hold on to what you have so that no one takes your crown. The one who conquers, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will never go out again. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. So it has been a delightful journey that we've been on these past several weeks. We've uh, actually traveled about uh, 200 miles uh, covering these six churches. And uh, these are uh, real churches that existed in John's day in what is known today as modern-day Turkey. And I am glad that we are joined online on uh, YouTube by uh, many who are attending these classes each week, and I'm thankful for some of the feedback that I've received from you and so I welcome you, and I know that uh, God is going to bless you as you study this book with us because he has promised to do that in the first chapter of our opening uh, when we began these, uh, this series. I read to you a promise that God made to the church in verse 3 of chapter 1, and I hope you've underlined it, and I hope you go to it occasionally because it's a reminder that uh, there's a reason why we're studying this book, because I don't know about you, but I like to be blessed. And he promises a special blessing to the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And he says, and blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep what is written in it because the time is near. So God not only wants us to read it, he wants us to study it. He wants us to hear the words of the prophecy, and then he says, blessed are those that, those that obey the words of this prophecy as well. Now, one of the interesting things that strikes me about this letter is the fact that Jesus, when he speaks to the church here at Philadelphia, he has absolutely no words of condemnation. He has no words of rebuke, nothing to condemn them for, nothing to rebuke them about, and that is uh, really pretty amazing. I was once told, if you find a perfect church, don't join it, because the minute you do, it won't be perfect anymore. But, uh, but it's nice to, to uh, uh, I, I believe that the Lord is holding that out to us, that he wants us to be like a church of Philadelphia, a church that he uh, doesn't find anything wrong with, a church that he doesn't uh, really rebuke or condemn. And uh, this church... Uh, has an interesting history. It's uh, called Philadelphia, which means the church of brotherly love. Two Greek words, love of brother, 
and it was founded by a ruler by the name of Attilus, who loved his brother so much that he said, I want to name this town Brotherly Love. And that's an amazing tribute that Attilus paid to his brother. And I'm told that uh, William Penn did the very same thing in Pennsylvania when they named Philadelphia, PA. That's my, my wife's uh, hometown where she was born. But it's Philadelphia, not, uh, not Turkey. It was built as a great gateway city to the east as there were five major roads that all converged on this city of Philadelphia. And Attilus actually built this city in order to spread his religion to the entire world. He said, I am going to establish my town at this here junction, and then I'm going to fill it with my temples so that the travelers coming through my city will come into my temples, and they will take my religion to the ends of the earth. In other words, it was actually built as a missionary city, reaching out to the ends of the earth, not to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, but to spread pagan religion. And therefore, it got the name Little Athens. And the reason it was called that is because of all the temples and the various gods and the various altars that were, were built there. So its main export was religion. And the second leading export was wine. It seems that uh, the, very, the soil uh, lent itself to vines and grape vineyards because of the volcanic clay, and uh, it's very acidic, and so grapes just thrive there. In other words, if you didn't get intoxicated on the religion, you could still get intoxicated on their wine. One other thing about this city is that along the main streets, Attilus placed a series of pillars on which were inscribed the names of some of the citizens of the of the city and the empire that he wanted to recognize and to honor. Now, here we find this town full of temples. It stood at the center of five major roads going out to the ends of the earth and stood this very small church there that we don't even know exactly how it got there. We don't know actually how it came into being, who it was that actually founded the church or started the church. But we have made some assumptions, and that is that the revival fires that were continuing to burn in the city of Ephesus, where the Apostle Paul preached for over a period of three years, and the word of God, it said, spread to the outlying areas, and eventually some Christians settled in Philadelphia, and they started this, this little church there in the city. Now, what these Christians did for employment, we don't really know, uh, but I know that jobs were very scarce because uh, most of the Christians would probably refuse to work in the wineries, and they certainly would not work in the heathen temples, and so they probably found employment as uh, shepherds, working the soil as farmers, and that's how they eked out a living. Another thing about this city was the fact that from time to time, the city was devastated by volcanic eruptions. And from time to time, the people actually had to run for their lives and flee the city as the volcano com coming down the mountain and flowing into their fields and into their homes. And so they'd have to run for their lives. It was a difficult place for these Christians to live. All, a little church that was surrounded by all these pagan influences. They were under constant pressure to worship in the heathen temples. And being Christians, they would not be able to work in the temples and they would not work in the, in the, in the vineyards. And so they were under pressure all the time. They were under pressure from Caesar worship was being demanded of them. And they were under pressure from the Jews that the Lord calls from the synagogue of Satan that was tormenting and slandering these Christians and making life difficult for them. In addition to that, they must live under the, th the threat of these volcanoes which erupted from time to time. So the question for these Philadelphia Christians is, 
What do we hang on to? Where do we find our strength? What enables us to cope with all these pressures and difficulties that we have to face week in and week out? What can we hang on to that will give us hope? In other words, what is to be the anchor for our soul? You know it helps to have an anchor to hang on to, don't you? Have an anchor that, that, that you can grip in the times of difficulty when life deals you a difficult deck or a difficult group of cards. That's what Jesus speaks to his letter of Philadelphia. He's speaking to that problem, problem of Christian people in a, a small church in a, in a large community where they were hated and where they were being persecuted. Jesus reminds the church of two things. And these two things are things that any church can benefit from. They're uh, things that you and I need to hang on to and hold on to. And what are those two things? Well, the two things that our Lord reminds them of are who they are before him. That's the first thing. Who they are before him. And he reminds them also of not only who they are, but what their mission is and what he's called them to. These two things he ever he wanted them to ever keep in front of them. So we need to know who Jesus is. Do you know who Jesus is? Well, verse 7 reads this way. If you go to verse 7, it says, Write to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. Thus says the Holy One, the true one, the one who has the key of David, the one who opens and no one will close, and who closes and no one opens. So this is Jesus speaking, and he's telling them who he is. He is saying, I am the Holy One. Now, this is a, an interesting expression, one of the titles for our Lord, and it's used actually 59 times in the Bible. And the vast majority of times that this title is used, it is a reference to God Almighty. I want you to look at Isaiah chapter 43 and at verse 15. It says, I am the Lord, the Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. So several things that we note here. He's saying, I am the Lord, that's God, Elohim, I am the Holy One, I am the Creator of Israel, and I am your King. You see, he's, he's making it very clear to hit them that he is different from all these pagan gods. These gods that, you, that are being worshipped in these temples are made of wood, they're made of stone. They can't speak, they can't talk, they can't hear, they can't communicate with you. There's nothing that they can actually do for you. And, and he's saying, but I am the Holy One. I am the Omnipotent One. I am the Creator, your Creator, the Creator of heaven and earth. And I am King of the universe, the Holy One of God. Then again in Isaiah chapter 40 at verse 25, it says, he says this, I, all these references I'm giving you are, are from the book of Isaiah. He says, to whom then will you liken me? Or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? And then if you go to Isaiah uh, chapter um, 6, Isaiah chapter 6, this is a very familiar uh, passage of Scripture that you're, you're going to recognize. Isaiah 6, beginning at verse 1. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a high and lofty throne, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphim were standing above him. They each had six wings. With two they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. And with two they flew. And one called to another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. His glory fills the whole the whole earth. So we see here <coughs> that we have an awesome God. He is the creator 
of heaven and earth. And in our Lord's introduction to this church of Philadelphia, Jesus echoes one of Isaiah's favorite names for God. In other words, he is telling them, he is God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the living and true God. That's the next thing he continues to describe himself as. He says, I am not only holy, but he says, I am true. So the, the true one who has the key of David, who opens and no one closes. The verse is so very clear and it's a, an allusion to the 22nd chapter of the book of Isaiah. And we don't have time to go there, but you can, you can mark that in your notes that you need to study that because that's where we find the first mention of the key of David. And it will tell you what the importance and significance of the key of David is. So what does it mean here? It simply means that you can trust him. You can trust him because he is a faithful God. He never lies to us, and he never shades the truth. He always speaks the truth. And in the case before the Philadelphia Christians, this is very important for them to hear. Look at verse uh, 9, and you see there Jesus uh, talks about the synagogue of uh, of Satan, and they were... Who, who was the synagogue of Satan? Well, the synagogue of Satan were, were Jews. They were Jews under the law. They still believed that in order to be enter the kingdom of God, you had to be circumcised. And so they were teaching circumcision. And of course, because the apostle Paul has been introduced them to the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, and we're transformed by the power of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God, and that's the way we gain entrance. And there's the circumcision that takes place as the circumcision of the heart rather than circumcision of the flesh. So he talks about this synagogue of Satan. They were saying to the Roman authorities that they were the true Jews, and that these Christians were, were not, they were imposters. They didn't really serve the true Messiah, and that this Jesus was not the Messiah at all. Jesus, they said, was an imposter. And because of these lies, these Christians were being persecuted. So Jesus comforts them by reminding them that he is God, that he is the one that is the true Messiah. And he is the promised descendant of King David. Because you remember that the promise was given to David that there would be a king that would sit upon the throne of the house of David forever and forever and forever. So the key of David and only he who has the key is the one that has the authority to allow anyone access into all the benefits of his kingdom. He has the key. He holds the key. And the one who holds the key also has the right to not only to invite people into the kingdom, but he also has the right to exclude anyone from those blessings as well. And those who reject me, he says, are not the true Israel of God. They belong to the synagogue of Satan. Now, the question that we have to ask ourselves is, do we know Jesus as God. Do we really believe that he is the omnipotent one, the creator of all things, of heaven and earth? And do you know that Jesus is the true Messiah, the one that has promised that he is coming again to be our king and that he will rule over this world someday as the king of kings and the Lord of all lords? Do you know that Jesus is the one that opens the door to the kingdom of heaven with all of its blessings? And do you know that Jesus is the one who closes the door to those who seek to come by some other way? In order for us to fight fear, and all all of us have have, uh, times when we are fearful, we all face things that that confront us, that make life very challenging. And uh, when uh, someone 
learns that they have cancer, when somebody learns that they have a, a tumor of the brain. Those are fearful things that we have to face. But Jesus is saying that in order to fight fear of suffering, fear of tribulation, to ward off anxiety, we have to know and be, and be convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt as to who Jesus is, that he alone will enable us to stand in the evil day. Not only do we <coughs> excuse me, need to know who Jesus is, but we also need to know who we are. Now, uh, I, I think very often uh, we have, um, uh, uh, we form opinions of ourselves that aren't really based upon the facts of God's word. We think we're strong. And he says, when you think you're strong, what? Take heed, that's what? Lest you fall. Uh, do you remember, um, wasn't it uh, Peter who said uh, uh, to the Lord, well, though all others fail you, I, I will never, you can bet on it, I will never fail you. I won't t t turn against you. And, and Jesus said, uh, this day you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows three times. Uh, you see, Peter doesn't, didn't really know his own heart. And very often we don't know our own hearts. Uh, we, we think we can uh, do things on our own. You know, especially us men, we just love to work things out our way. We, we're going to fix it. And uh, Jesus wants us to know who we really are. And what does he think about us? Well, look at verse 8. He says, I know you have but a little power. Now, that doesn't sound like he's saying that we're strong. We have a lot of strength. He's saying you, you have just a, a little power. So, uh, they don't sound very comforting to, to me. So why does Jesus remind them of their weakness? Well, Jesus reminds us of our weakness, and he reminds us of his strength. Now, I remember John 15 at verse 15. Uh, beautiful chapter. Beautiful passage of scripture. He says, I am the vine, and you are the branches, <laughs> and <laughs> every branch that abides in me brings forth much fruit. Every, uh, did you get that? We, we, as we abide in him, he says that we bring forth much fruit. If we remain in me and I in him, you, I will produce much fruit in you because you can do nothing, he says, without me. That's how helpless we really are in our own strength. So Jesus is telling us, I know in and of yourself that you are very weak. And we need to admit that to ourselves. We need to admit that we're weak rather than pretending that we're strong. He says, I expect nothing more from you than weakness. You are weak. I do not count on you becoming strong on your own. You are supposed to be weak. Don't let that trouble you because he says, I'm strong. What did Jesus say to Paul when he prayed to have a weakness removed? Well, let's go to that passage of Scripture in uh, 2 Corinthians, it is. And <laughs> chapter 12, uh, beginning at verse, uh, well, uh, yeah, uh, verse um, um, 8, 7 or 8, I'll start with 7. Therefore, well, let's see, especially because of the extraordinary rev revelations, therefore, so that I would not exalt myself, Paul says, a thorn in the flesh. Remember that passage? A thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan, to torment me so that I would not exalt myself. Concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it would leave me. 
But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may reside in me. So I take pleasure in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and in difficulties for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So, you see, if we come to the realization that, that we are weak, we'll lean into him, casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. He said, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So when you're faced with problems, difficulties, stresses, tribulations, lean into Christ, cast every burden on him, and he will be your source of strength. So Jesus reminds Philadelphia of some ways that he's going to exert his power in their behalf. He says, I will keep you from harm. I will keep you from harm. What is going to happen to these Jews, this synagogue of Satan? Will they harm the church? Well, they seemed like a mighty force. Uh, it, it, it seemed almost overwhelming to these Christians in this church. This isn't the first time we've heard about this synagogue of Satan. We saw them in Smyrna as well. So will they harm the church? Well, what does the Lord tell us? Uh, when, he, when he spoke to Peter and he says, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will what? Will not prevail against it. In verse 9, Jesus says, I will make, and note, note those words, he says, I will make them come and bow down before your feet. Now, we will come back to this a little later on, but for now, I want you to note that he promises that, that this church will not be harmed by the, by the synagogue of Satan. They may appear to be a threatening force, but Jesus will make them perfectly harmless. And then in verse 10, he says, and I will keep you from the hour of trial." that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell upon the earth. Now, we're, we're going to uh, note this verse because it's a very important passage of Scripture. And uh, uh, there's people who seem to think they know what this verse says, uh, but I, 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 you know, we're supposed to, when we look at the scriptures, we're supposed to do uh, exegesis of the scriptures. Now, what do I mean by exegesis? I mean we're to look at the text and the context, and we're to extract from what the scripture actually says to discover the meaning. We're to extract from the text and the context in which it is written. But a lot of people have developed a new system of theology, and that is called eisegesis. And that is where they read into the text their own preconceived ideas as to what they think the text means and ought to say. And um, believe you me, that, that's a dangerous position uh, when we're studying God's Word. And I want you to look at this text very carefully. And uh, at verse 10, he says, Because you have kept my command to endure. So that's one thing. Uh, he's, he's looking at this church and he's saying, that You've done something right. You, you've, you've been obedient to me. You've kept my command, and you've endured to endure. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it means that 
whatever came down the pike, whatever struggles that they had to face, whatever difficulties and challenges that they met, they persevered through them. They endured. They kept the faith. They remained true to God. They didn't go by their feelings or their emotions or what other people were saying around them. They stuck true to the word of God and they were obedient to the Lord. He said, because you have kept my command to endure, I also will keep you from the hour of testing that is going to come on the whole world to test those who live on the earth. Now, uh, we have to look at what this actually does say and what it does not say. The, some people are teaching, and I would say throughout most of evangelical Christendom today, they are teaching that this is a verse of Scripture that teaches that we are not going to be here through tribulation, but that God is going to rescue us and deliver us out of tribulation, keep us from going through tribulation, and he's going to rapture us and catch us away before that hour of testing. He, they also teach that the hour of testing means the entire period of the seven years of tribulation that, the, that, that is promised to us and prophesied to us throughout the word of God that there is a period at the end of the age of seven years known as a period known as Jacob's trouble the period of great tribulation. Then, and, but notice that the text says he's going to keep them from the hour, the hour of tribulation or the hour of affliction that's going to come upon the whole world. Doesn't say seven year period of time. Doesn't mention that. Doesn't mention anything in this chapter that there's going to be a, 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 a rapture of the church at this particular time. So, the, look at what the text says and base your opinions and your theology on what the text is actually saying. So what is the Lord trying to teach us here? Well, what does he mean? He says, I will keep you out of the hour of trial. Hour of trial, it doesn't tell us what the hour of trial is. Now, um, Jesus might have known, and, and remember, I told you before that uh, all the blessings and, that are, are made to the church were from the very first century down through the 20th, 21st century. So, so the, if, if the rapture is in view here, then <coughs> that had to be true for the first century when they went through their period of suffering and tribulation as much as it is for the 21st century. So you see, I don't believe that the, the, the rapture has anything to do with this passage of Scripture here. Now, there are several reasons why that interpretation seems to be unlikely. First of all, I want you to go to John 17 and at verse, verse 15. Uh, John 17, I think it's up on the screen. There are several reasons why that interpretation seems unlikely, and the first one is this. Jesus uses the same Greek construction as in John 17 at verse 15. Now, you know this verse in John 17 where our Lord is uh, giving his uh, high priestly prayer, and he's praying for his disciples. He is about ready to go back to be with his father, and he knows that he's leaving the disciples uh, in a very difficult situation. They had him to depend on for these past three, three and a half years. Now that he's leaving them, he's not, they're not going to have him to rely on in the way that they've been accustomed to relying on him. And so he's praying to his father in heaven about the disciples that he's about to leave behind and send them out amongst wolves and amongst hardships, martyrdom, persecution. All those things were lying before them. And he says to his father, 
Father, I do not ask you to take them out of the world. You see, in other words, uh, I'm not praying that you ra rapture them out of this world. I'm not praying that you take them away from all these hardships and difficulties that I'm sending them out into the world to face. He says, I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but here's what I ask you to do. He says, I ask that you keep them from the evil one. Now, who's the evil one? That's Satan. Satan. He says, keep them from the evil one. Secondly, the second reason is that John has already put a whole lot of emphasis in this book of Revelation on the fact that all believers are to expect tribulation. Over and over again, we find in the Word of God where it says that in the world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. It is through much tribulation that we will enter the kingdom of God. Uh, and look at Revelation chapter 1 and then verse 9. It says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and in the kingdom and endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So John is, uh, is telling us that that's why he was on the island of Patmos to begin with. It was because he had to face tribulation and, and, and hardships and suffering for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they wanted to get rid of him. They put him out there on that island. So I, John, your brother and partner in the affliction and the kingdom and the endurance that are in Jesus. So we can see that John himself finds a face, face serious tribulation. In fact, that is why he was suffering the way he was as a prisoner there on this island. And then you will recall that we emphasized in chapter 1 of Revelation the promise of blessing to all who read, all who hear, all who keep what is written therein. So the blessing must be available, must be applicable to all believers living any time after this book of Revelation was written. In other words, how does this promise help believers in John's day if the promise was meant only for believers at the end of the age in the 21st century? How does this help Christians in the midst of their persecution from the, the Jews and the Romans in this city? Therefore, it is unlikely that this is a promise about being raptured before the tribulation. So then how are we to understand this promise? What does Jesus mean when he says, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming upon the whole world? What is Jesus saying to them that can comfort their hearts and strengthen their souls? The word keep is an important word. It can also be translated guard. I will keep them or I will guard them or I will protect them. Now, uh, you see, uh, we need to look at the patterns of how God protects his people and how he protected them in the past because it gives us an idea of God's ways. And if you will remember that when God delivered the children of Israel out of bondage in Egypt, he sent a series of 10 plagues upon the Egyptian people and uh, uh, in order to break their, their spirit, uh, and in order to get them to the place where they were willing to comply and allow the children of Israel to go. And you, you know that when these plagues came upon the children of Israel, where were the children of Israel living? Do you remember? Well, I want you to go to, I think, uh, Exodus chapter 8. Go to Exodus chapter 8 and uh, look at uh, verse 22.
Exodus 8, I think it's at verse uh, 22. Oh, I'm in Genesis. That's why I can't find it. Yeah, here it is. But on that day, I will give special treatment to the land of Goshen, where my people are living. No flies will be there. This way you will know that I, the Lord, am in the land, and I will make a distinction between my people and your people. This sign will take place tomorrow. So when God sent the plague upon the Egyptians, he did not send it upon the children of Israel. He protected them. He preserved them. And, and, and their, uh, their families that were under his divine protection. So Jesus is saying to us today, he says, I will guard you. I will protect you from the hour of trial that all men face. In other words, Jesus says, you are weak. Don't forget that. But I am strong. My power is made perfect in your weakness. And I will protect you from the trials that you face in this life. Whether they are big trials or whether they're little trials, you do not need to fear. He does not want us to live in fear. Fear not, for I am with you, and I will strengthen your heart, he says. Nothing can happen to you apart from my permission. Did you know that? Nothing can happen to you. Nothing, nothing can come upon you that God doesn't, first of all, give permission to allow to, to come into your life. We see this in Job's life. Remember? Satan came before God and his angels and uh, challenged God over Job and uh, said the only reason Job serves you because you got a hedge built around him. You know, take down that hedge. Well, he had to get permission from God to bring suffering and hardship into Job's life. But remember the promise, and this is what we have to do. So life sometimes is hard. It's very difficult. And some of the stresses and pressures in life are extremely complicated and difficult for us to deal with. And so all things, Romans 8, 28, I've used this so, so many times, God's had to remind me of it because I, I'm known to have some pity parties at times, feeling sorry for myself. But Romans 8, 28 says what? All things... We, he says, we know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to his might, called according to his power, his word. So uh, God will take the, even the bad things in life that we go through, even the difficulties, the sufferings, he will take that and he will make them stepping stones to success. He will use it for good in your life. He will accomplish good things out of even the bad things. So Jesus reminds them that they are weak, but he protects them now and in the future. Come what may, Jesus says, I'm going to be with you. I am strong, and I will never leave you, and I'll never forsake you, and I'll go with you all the days of your life. And then third, he reminds them that he himself is the one who opens the way into the very presence of God. Verse 8 says, I have set before you an open door, which no one, no one is able to shut. What is the door? What is the door that he's opening here? Well, there's many different ideas that people have, but I believe that it's, first of all, the door into his presence, the door that opens up to allow us access into the very presence of God. And verse 12 of Revelations chapter 3 brings this out. Verse 12 says, the one who conquers, I'm going to make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will never go out again. And I will write on him 
the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my, and my new name. So here we find that verse in verse 12 that the temple that God promises us to have access to and be a part of that temple when he comes back and sets up his kingdom and has that millennial temple built. That temple is a picture of the presence of God among mankind. It's the presence of God is in Jerusalem, the temple city. It is also a picture of God's presence. And then if you will go to Ezekiel chapter 48 and look at verse 35, it says, <coughs> in 48, 35, it says, and the name of the city from that, di- that time on shall be the Lord is there. Can you imagine God coming to earth to live with his people? God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are going to be a part of that temple. That's going to be our abiding place during the millennium. And we're going to have access into his presence at all times. In other words, God's presence will be there. So to be in the temple of God, To be in the new Jerusalem is to be in the very presence of Almighty God. So Jesus provided an open door for them to be in his presence now and in the future. We have uh, access into his presence even now. He says in, in Hebrews, come boldly before the throne of grace that you might receive mercy and find help in your time of need. So we have access into his presence even now, today. And that's why we need to come before him in prayer, bringing our petitions and all of our concerns. He is a God that hears and he answers prayer. Amen, brother? Amen. <laughs> Next, now, not only that, but they, he says, I'll make you a pillar in my temple, Uh, and I will write on you the name of my God, and they shall never leave my presence. Remember how I told you that Atlas uh, built uh, uh, up and down Main Street on both sides of the Main Street of of Philadelphia? He, He had these pillars erected to put the name of very important and prestigious people engraved their names on that to honor them. Well, Jesus is saying, I'm going to make you a pillar and I'm going to put my name on you and I'm going to display you in my holy city. So no matter what you face, these are assuring words from our Lord. And he says that he's going to allow us to be forever in his presence when he comes back. And then he tells us we are weak. Jesus says, I will protect you while you are in this world. He brings us into the very presence of God when we leave this world. But that is not all. We are not only to endure. He wants us to thrive. Jesus has things for us to accomplish. He's not just going to save us, but and he does that through the blood of Jesus Christ, and he gives us entrance into his kingdom. But he has a a calling upon each of our lives, and he sends us out to serve him, to minister for him. And he provides, he says, I'm going to provide you an open door. Well, uh, I've uh, recently been talking to uh, one of my sons up north, and (laughs) he said he's been praying for, for uh, a long time about what uh, he can do, uh, how he can use his gifts for the Lord. And uh, recently he told me that uh, he, uh, he went to the pastor and they have the church that he's going to has quite a bit of land. And he, he said that, uh, you know, he said, I love to work in the dirt 
And he said, I like planning things. So he said, I got the idea that maybe we could start a community garden uh, for, for the community in which they live. And so he uh, recently said that they bought a plow and he's been down there tilling up the ground. Now he's, he found that his gifts weren't to be a, a preacher or a Sunday school teacher, but he has gifts that God has given him and he put a passion in his heart and he's fulfilling his passion. He's doing what God is directing him to do and in that way, serving the Lord, reaching out to the community, making food available to those that, that have a need. That, that's a wonderful avenue to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to, very similar to what we're trying to accomplish here at Second Chance Church. Now, God has a way of opening doors, and he has a way of closing doors. Uh, go to Colossians chapter 4, verse 3. Uh, it says, at the same time, Paul is praying here, and he says, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Jesus Christ. So uh, Paul recognized that, <laughs> that he was dependent upon, uh, upon the Lord to open these doors for him. And he prayed very often that the, the, the Holy Spirit would go before him to open the doors, open the doors to people's hearts, open the doors to where on to preach the gospel and proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ. It, it was in the mind of the Apostle Paul at one time to go into to uh, uh, reach all of Asia for the Lord. And uh, uh, but he says that the Holy Spirit hindered him and he had a vision that night and someone from Macedonia said, come over here. And so the Lord closed one door and he opened up another. And, and he does that to us, for us, in, when we're looking for jobs. We might have in my mind uh, that this is the job that God means for me to have, and he may close the door. And then he, over here, he'll open up another door. And so uh, what we should be do, what we should be doing is we should be seeking God to show us what, uh, what is the door that you have for me to go through? Where do you want me to be utilizing my gifts and my abilities and trusting in God that he'll direct you. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened unto you, saith the Lord. Well, it's time has slipped away from us all. I didn't get as far as I had hoped to get, but we'll take up this, finish this chapter, Lord willing, next week. Then we go on to Laodicea, and then from <laughs> Laodicea, uh, we go to chapter 4, and this is, chapter 4 is a very interesting chapter. If we're going to be leaving this earth, and we're going to be traveling to heaven. An open door is opened up into heaven, and John is called up. And so we're going to see the very throne room of God, and that's an exciting chapter. You don't want to miss it. So let's have a word of prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Father God, Thank you for your presence in our midst. Thank you for the word of God. And we just pray that <laughs> you would open our eyes and help us to behold wonderful things out of the word of the living God. May it come alive to our hearts. And then, Lord, I pray that you would use each of us for your honor, for your glory. Help us to be a bold witness to our families and our loved ones and minister to them the wonderful grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who can transform their lives and use them to bring glory to your precious name in the days ahead. We ask these things in your mighty name, in Christ's name, amen, amen. amen.